Watching on TV is sending a good message. I have been able to bring PBS Learning Media into my classroom. It's rewarding knowing that I've touched a family, touched a child, and made a difference in their life. And PBS is part of that. You're watching New England Public Media on WGBY Springfield. The American identity begins when Benjamin Franklin knit the American colonies together. Franklin is endlessly interesting. Printer, scientist, revolutionary. He is the only founding father who evidently had a sense of humor. His vision is broader than the American Revolution. The things that he spoke of, that he wrote about, had a certain amount of power. He really was an American genius. Ken Burns, Benjamin Franklin, April 4th, or stream at nepm.org. Coming up, we're connecting you with the creativity and culture in your community, including a look back at the life and legacy of a legendary Berkshires filmmaker. Doug's whole body of work was about immersing the audience in just a more profound experience of film. We'll head to the drawing table with Hartford-based cartoonist Joe Young. And I said, I gotta do this because art is supposed to provoke conversation and advancing racial solidarity and equity through a musical celebration of black history. How do you harness the power of music, this universal language, as a way to uh, sort of open doors that don't open on their own? Join us for those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. Up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Welcome, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point, your source for creativity, culture, and community. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Legendary Hollywood special effects wizard, filmmaker, and inventor Douglas Trumbull passed away in February of this year. The Oscar-winning Berkshires resident was responsible for the dazzling visuals in some of the most iconic films in cinema history. Later in his career, he turned to creating experiential rides like the Back to the Future simulator at Universal Studios, developing them right here in Western Massachusetts. Trumbull was still working on cutting edge immersive cinema technology right up until his passing. And executive producer Tony Dunn takes a look back at his life and legacy through his own words and in reflections from some of those who knew him. Doug's whole body of work was about immersing the audience in just a more profound experience of film. And what he created in the special effects world, it changed film forever for us. We look at film in a whole different way because of the things that Doug put in place. Name one movie that he's done that hasn't been elevated by his work. Not just elevated, but made because of his work. By anyone's measure, Oscar-winning motion picture director and visual effects legend Douglas Trumbull was a genius and a visionary and one to whom science fiction movie lovers owe a great debt. Well, first of all, there was nobody that created our vision of space better than Doug Trumbull. He just was the master at what space looks like. But for the man responsible for the mind-bending visuals in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, for making the Starship Enterprise fly on the big screen for director Robert Wise, and for creating the dystopian future of Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, special effects were merely tools in service to a greater cause. It wasn't just his effects work, it was he, he brought story to the effects. He also gave a lot of his input to the directors about how he felt the story should go. And a lot of, a lot of directors listened to him. Douglas Trumbull passed away on February 7th, 2022. Though he called the Berkshires home, his career started in Hollywood with a passion to make going to the movies more than just viewing images on a screen. My interest is in experiential movies, what I call immersive cinema. And so it's a completely different way of telling a story. And I got hooked on it long ago as a very young guy when I was working on a 2001 Space Odyssey for Stanley Kubrick. And so that was my introduction to feature film movie making. And so. 
it led to a really you know terrific resume because being associated with that movie and special effects was a calling card that would get me into any studio and that led to Blade Runner and Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Star Trek the Motion Picture and you know a lot of those kind of movies. Not satisfied with bringing others visions to life Trumbull soon turned his own hand to directing but the bureaucracy of the entertainment business left a bitter taste in his mouth. He had been in Hollywood for many years, developed um, a high frame rate um, film technique called show scan, and had directed two films, Silent Running and Brainstorm, and he was hoping that the studios would do uh, the films at a higher frame rate, and they wouldn't do it. So he got very frustrated, he moved out here to the Berkshires. And I started looking for work that would not be feature films, because I was just co completely burnt out on the whole thing. And in 1989, Steven Spielberg was hired by Universal Studios to do the Back to the Future ride. And he said there's only one person on the planet to do it, and it's Doug Trumbull. And it was a simulation ride. And I had developed the whole simulation ride concept years before when I was at Paramount. And they couldn't figure out how to make it work. And I said, well, I'll do it. I'll, I'd love to do it. So we did the whole Back to the Future ride in these old textile mills in Housatonic, Massachusetts, about you know 20 minutes from here. And that was proof to me that we could actually do world-class filmmaking in a remote location like this. He was incredible. I mean, his generosity, people talk about it all the time, but um, I witnessed it with, uh, I mean, literally dozens of filmmakers that we would bring to his property. He would spend time with them. They could reach out afterwards. He was 100% about the next generation. He was 100% about um, being a mentor, being an inspiration for films and filmmakers. You know, I came here 30 years ago and I met my husband, I had two children, I created another company, Mass Illusion, after working with him, and, you know, I, I told him, maybe not enough, but I'm grateful because my life and my career are here because of him. And it happened for me and so many people. And while his impact on the art and craft of filmmaking is undeniable, Douglas Trumbull's greatest legacy might just lie in the people that he touched along the way. And to me and most people on the set, he wasn't a technical person. He just he brought everybody together and his, his gleam in his eye was contagious. Everyone was drawn to it and wanted to make it work the way he saw it. So that, he was a storyteller more than anything else. He taught us how to think out of the box. And that was, I think, the biggest lesson from Doug, is not to do what's already been done, but to figure out what's next and what's going to create that excitement for the audience. Doug lived up here. We live here, but Doug lived up here. And he was, he was, yeah, he was an incredible person. And for more of the cinematic wizardry of the late Oscar-winning filmmaker and special effects wizard Douglas Trumbull, log on to our webpage for a digital extra as he discusses some of the innovative, immersive filmmaking techniques that he developed at his Berkshire studio. And I found out years ago when I was doing my show scan film process, which was one of my stepping stones along the way to immersive cinema, that I was shooting 70 millimeter film at 60 frames a second, putting it on giant screens at double the brightness. And everybody said, my God, you know, it's like, it's like 3D without glasses. I feel that the movie screen has become a window onto reality. And I started exploring how to make a new kind of movie experience. You can find that digital extra and so much more online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. When Connecticut native Joe Young struggled in school as a child, he found that comic books offered him a positive escape while educating him on topics that he could not previously comprehend. Young was then able to turn that passion for drawing and storytelling into a career and is now an award-winning cartoonist, filmmaker, producer, writer, and teaching artist. I joined Young at his studio in East Hartford to hear more about his story, his latest comic series, and his collaboration with legendary Motown artist Smokey Robinson. It was the creative arts that saved me, specifically uh, writing, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then when I start writing, I got into comics. So that whole comic art space changed me. Because when I was in school, I was a slow learner. And uh, I made, kids made fun of me. I made fun of myself. And I named myself the Fisherman because all my grades were below sea level. 
But then through comics, I learned about geography, about character, about science. And so a lot of my work is based on comics. And from that, once you learn how to write comics, you can write scripts. And then I learned how to draw at a, at a later age. But writing was my first um, introduction to art. Comic art specifically has been one of the greatest influences in your life, and it has really led to your success. Um, but speak to me about what what is it about that art form specifically that you're so passionate? Why were you able to connect with comic art? Because, good question, because art is engaging. It's visually attractive. It's fun. It's inter entertaining. Uh, I remember growing up, I learned about uh, government, not through social studies class. It was a show called Schoolhouse Rock. I'm just a bill. On, <laughs> and so, and even now for me to reach kids, because I do a lot of workshops, I teach cartooning, and kids seem to gravitate towards it and cartoon work. And it's just something about comic where I think I found my purpose when I discovered comic art. Yeah, and comics also kind of provide children with an escape and also oh, yes. inspiration. And so that brings me to your most recent comic series, Kemet. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about this series, how it's unique to your other creations, and also how important is it to have this representation, for especially, especially for children of color, um, in comics or literature? Actually, Kemet was created during COVID. Kemet is a time traveler. He travels through time. He's born in 1771, and he is picked up by slave catchers. He goes through the Middle Passage. He comes to America. This is in 1776. He meets Benjamin Banneker, the famous, it's all fictional, um, inventor, and they create a time machine. And he travels to the 21st century to tell people in the future, if you're going through a problem, you can overcome it. Look what people did in the past, and he brings them back, and he shows them through black history and black excellence, anybody can do anything. And what does this do for a child's um, confidence when they have this representation in a comic that they love to read? They see Kemet, he goes through challenges and problems and issues, but he always overcomes it because of good character. But it's an escape for them. They can live vicariously through Kemet and he's cool. He's got the natural hair when he takes off his baseball cap and he speaks with an African accent. Mm -hmm. And so they can identify with this character and he can dance, he can break dance. He, and the parents enjoy him because he loves old school music. His favorite musician is James Brown. And so Kemet came out of COVID, um, but something else that has come out recently, you've been very busy during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you have produced a short animated film, de your depiction of the Smokey Robinson poem, Black American. Yep. Tell me about that and why now is the perfect time to release this animated film. Because of, after George Floyd, race relations and, uh, you, you know, race is such an issue. You know, I, I met Smokey at a mutual friend of our Curtis Robinson's golf tournament, and he started reciting this poem. And I said, wow, it is so powerful. But I also saw that some folks may not like what he's saying in the poem. Mm -hmm. And I said, I got to do this because art is supposed to provoke conversation. And I agree with a lot of stuff that Smokey says. Some things, you, you know, I need some more clarity. But my thing was create this thing and animate what he's trying to say. And I'd appreciate it if when you see me, you'd say, there goes a man who said it loud. I'm black, I'm black. I'm a black American and I'm proud because I love being an American. And, and again, that just took off. I and that was a dream back. come true to work with yeah, an icon like Smokey Robinson, you know. Now, you were born in Hartford, mm -hmm. but have deep roots in Springfield, Massachusetts as well. What are you most proud about being from this part of the region? It's just rich with history, architecture, and the people are second to none. You, you can find a little bit of everybody in New England and they're very creative in New England, that Yankee in ingenuity. This is where I'm at, where I'm trying to make a difference. Even though you could do it anywhere in the world because of technology, Harvard's been good, Springfield's been good to me. So I'm just, I'm just a blessed individual geographically.
Every week, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England, but it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. Nationally acclaimed cartoonist, filmmaker, producer, and writer Joe Young has earned a recognition that few of us have. In 1999, Young became a Guinness Book of World Records holder for creating the longest comic strip in the world. In this week's digital exclusive, he shares the story of how the community came out to support him in his quest for this honor. People thought I was crazy. So the city of Hartford gave me a whole park, a whole facility. They built a big easel to do it. I called all my friends and we had 5,000 kids from all over. They said 2,000, it was really 5,000 from all over New England to paint on this comic strip. You can find that digital exclusive online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. From an early age, Laura Radwell dreamed of being an artist, and with a career in marketing and communications, she always tried to incorporate visual components into her work. So when she began to wind down her business, she decided to go back to her dream of being a painter. Today, she works out of her studio at Cottage Street in East Hampton, creating large-scale paintings that focus on atmosphere and her inner impressions of the landscape. Producer Dave Frazier visited her there and brings us her story. I don't necessarily have a plan in mind. Sometimes I have a color feeling in mind and I just let something emerge. At one point in my working life, I, I noticed that everything I did was gravitating toward the visual and I think that was some kind of a subconscious attempt to satisfy my dream. Sometimes I wake up in the morning with colors on my mind. They may have come to me in dreams. They may have come to me from something I saw the evening before or the drive into the studio in the morning. Between Northampton and East Hampton where my studio is at Cottage Street is only 12 minutes but there are some beautiful fields and wild things that I sometimes see and the change of the seasons. I'm very attuned to the colors and the tones of the atmosphere really. So that can affect what happens when I open the door to the studio and I open the paints and I typically will mix a palette and it's not always the same. I think that in traditional working styles you're supposed to lay out your palette in a particular order. You're supposed to have your whole array so you can mix anything. I don't do that. I think that I'm just uh, unschooled and I'm a bit rebellious. So I mix the colors that I like, that I want to work with in that particular day. And I'll put the canvas on the easel and I'll just let it rip. I was handed some uh, what we call chippy brushes and you buy them at hardware stores and they cost under two dollars for a variety of sizes and I came to really appreciate them because they're rough and they show the brush stroke and to me that equates with some kind of emotion and some kind of spontaneity and I really like using them plus I can throw them away I can wash them once or twice and then I can throw them away without feeling any guilt I think there's a certain kind of a mystery in the paintings given that they don't represent actual places and often I'm asked where is that place and I will say it is not a place it's a place that you can define it's a place that you can go to if you so wish I could say that I'm having the time of my life I'm very grateful I'm very excited I feel hopeful that I'll have a lot of time left because I have so many ideas and so many things I'd like to explore. This is a dream come true. Earlier this month, the Black Legacy Project made its formal debut after its inception last year in the Berkshires. The project, which is produced by the local nonprofit Music in Common, is an innovative musical celebration of black history with the goal of advancing racial solidarity and equity. 
This initiative will be traveling and collaborating with communities nationwide, bringing artists of all backgrounds together to record and compose songs central to the Black American experience. I spoke with co-directors Todd Mack and Trey Carlisle to hear how they are merging the past with the present in order to move forward. We were inspired to create this in 2020 in the height of the killings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor. And we wanted to create spaces where Black and white Americans, and really all Americans, can come together and engage in intergenerational conversations, not just about the legacy of racism in the U.S., but the legacy of Black and white folks working in solidarity to help us move forward. So that was the inspiration for it. And as a result, what we do is we will go to a specific community, facilitate roundtable discussions that bring Black and white community members together to explore songs centered around the Black American experience and explore how they still relate to the issues today. And then we have local Black and white artists create present day interpretations of those songs as well as original songs about how we can move forward. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Speak up, speak up. Stand up, stand up. Now, you said something that stood out to me. You were talking about, you know, Black and white Americans coming together, um, all Americans, really, you said. And so although the project is called the Black Legacy Project, you really have an emphasis on bringing people from all backgrounds together. Why is that so crucial? Mainly because we're a mosaic of uh, society in the United States. We have people from all sorts of racial, ethnic, cultural, religious backgrounds, uh, and while the um, uh, conflict, and I'm going to call it a conflict because I think that's really the approach uh, that we're taking to building solidarity and belonging and, and uh, equity, um, is uh, rooted historically in black and white. Um, in 2022, uh, it's really the, the country as a whole um, that, that I think needs to address this. Now, this is a musical celebration um, of Black history, as you were saying. Why was music the art form chosen for this project? Music is a powerful tool of connection and empathy. And the empathetic and connecting aspects of music we have found over the past 17 years can be a powerful tool to enhance peace building and engage people in the same type of practices that we need to have in building peace, collaboration, listening to one another, recognizing our interdependence and working together. But also we recognized when we conceptualized the project, these songs that were written by black and white artists alike, whether it's songs like Lift Every Voice and Sing written by James Weldon Johnson, or whether songs written by white folks in solidarity like The Hurricane by um, Bob Dylan, these songs that spoke to the legacy and realities of racial conflict and violence in the past, they still ring true today. And they have a special place in folks' hearts. So we wanted to create a space for folks to revisit these songs, see how they still relate today, and create um, new songs for how we can move forward. Speaking um, to those songs that you're talking about, over three dozen local musicians came together for this project, which is amazing. And so you recorded six songs that address the theme, Hope in a Hateful World. And four of the songs were, like you were just saying, songs that have been revisited on um, past songs and then two originals. So tell me about that process of the song selection um, and just kind of reimagining and, and revisiting and examining these songs. One of the things that we do is uh, choose songs that have a direct connection to the community that the project is in. And uh, that's a lot of exhaustive research that Trey primarily takes the lead on, uh, looking at um, what songs, what artists have a connection, uh, or even themes have a connection to the local community. I'm glad that you brought up that connection um, that the songs have to the local history, because that was something that really amazed me when I was reading about the project. All of those selections, the four um, existing songs, have a tie in to Berkshire specifically with Black history. So can you share um, some of that connection that the songs have to the area? 
So one of the songs we chose was Strange Fruit, which is written by Abel Maripol and made popular by Billie Holiday. And Billie Holiday performed a couple of times in the Berkshires, especially in the later part of her career when she was performing Strange Fruit. And then Strange Fruit was written by Abel Maripol, who was friends and associates with W.B. Du Bois. W.B. Du Bois is like an iconic thought leader and advocate for Black legacy. And he was born and raised in Great Barrington in the Berkshires. So that was the tie that Strange Fruit has to the song, to the Black Legacy Project and to the Berkshires. We also had folks create an artistic interpretation of W.B. Du Bois' poem, My Country Tis in Thee. And then we chose Lift Every Voice and Sing for Artists to Explore, which is written by James Walden Johnson, who would travel to the Berkshires to do some of his most meaningful writings in poetry. And then We Shall Overcome, we also chose the song to explore, which was made popular by Pete Seeger, who has close ties with the Guthrie family, like Woody Guthrie, Arlo Guthrie, whose home base is in the Berkshires. Todd, I know that you found um, that in response to the murder of your friend and bandmate, Daniel Pearl, who was abducted and murdered in Pakistan in 2002. Um, and so this was in response to that. And you've done amazing work in over 300 communities helping repair these fractures. So how does it feel um, to be carrying on this type of legacy work? And then, Trey, how does it feel to be part of it as well? Mm, wow. That's a great question. And, th and thank you for, for that acknowledgement. And, you know, I think the work that we're doing with the Black Legacy Project, really like everything that I think Music in Common has been engaged in, is how do you harness the power of music, this universal language, as a way to uh, sort of open doors that don't open on their own? I think there's such a direct correlation to what we're doing now uh, as much as the work that we've done in interfaith contexts or in, uh, in overseas in the Middle East or the Far East. And it's just amazing to be a part of it. And it's amazing to see it grow. And it's amazing to have new young leaders who start out as participants mm -hmm. in our programs come take the reins and help lead it. And that does it for this edition of Connecting Point. Remember, you can always find all of the stories that you saw in this episode, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and so much more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. And please be sure to join us again every week right here for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Sadalis Bauer. Thanks for watching and have a good night. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. The American identity begins when Benjamin Franklin knit the colonies together. Franklin is endlessly interesting. Printer, scientist, revolutionary. The things that he spoke of had a certain amount of power. He really was an American genius. Ken Burns' Portrait of Benjamin Franklin premieres April 4th on NEPM. At nine years old, Maren Alsop had big dreams. I'm going to be the conductor when I grow up. What, are you kidding? Women don't do that. I said, oh, no, no, no. Don't tell me I can't do something. Follow the resilient journey of the first woman to lead a major American orchestra. It feels like I'm in a dream, in a way. And how she fought for her place at the podium to inspire a new generation on great performances. Meet the conductor Friday at 9 or stream at nebm.org. Know what I'm saying? <laughs> Try to stay out of trouble. Where's the fun in that? You know how ladies can be. I'ma do what I do. Social studies, 30. 61 seasons of local high school wit. Suffield. One. One is correct. Nice. As schools match wits, pits area high schools against each other in a fun, competitive quiz show. Where? Mississippi. Mississippi is right. Watch your favorite weekly quiz show Saturday night at 7 or stream it at nepm.org. This week, Suffield Academy takes on where on As Schools Match Wits. Take math and science 30. Math and science for 30. Okay, here we go. Mere liye to bahut hi risky hai. 
तो इन दमंग लोगों ने क्या किया उसको पत्थर मारकर हत्या कर दी औरतों के हाथ में अगर पावर हो तो वो क्या कर सकते हैं मेरा दिल हौसला देता है Watch Riding with Fire Monday at 10 or stream at nepm.org. How would you like to double the impact of your gift to New England Public Media? Dozens of local businesses are matching their employees' contributions dollar for dollar, and one of those local businesses or institutions might be yours. Support the programs you love in a big way. Learn more at nepm.org. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. Desperate to escape the childhood trauma that's haunted him for years comes a story of reflection, resilience, and release. Starring Will Liverman, Angel Blue, and Latonya Moore. See the Met Make History with Terrence Blanchard's adaptation of Charles M. Blow's memoir, Fire Shut Up in My Bones. On great performances at the Met. The Curtain Rises on Excellence, April 1st at 9 on...